The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here with Self uh, 2014. That is the year, right? Yeah. Uh, this is Andy Grimm. He's an operations support engineer at Red Hat. He's here to talk about C groups. I'm sure we'll all learn a lot. So I'll leave with you. OK, thanks. Uh, yeah, as he said, I'm Andy. I am an operations engineer, which means that uh, for OpenShift Online, I'm basically supporting the operating system uh, underneath everyone's web apps that they're launching in OpenShift. Um, so uh, it, it's been a really interesting exercise in trying to contain users. Um, and C groups is just one small part of, of what we use to do that. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, so just a brief rundown of, of how I've structured this. Um, first, just a little bit about you know, what C groups are and, and why you should care about them. Um, then we'll talk about a couple of the most commonly used control groups uh, and, and tunables. Uh, and then I'll get into some of the, the tools that you use to actually set up your configuration files and get your processes placed into C groups. Um, and, and then uh, We'll talk about system D and how that kind of changed the way that C groups are being managed in newer Linux distros. Um, and as we have time, maybe we'll talk about other controllers and things. I don't exactly know how long this talk is going to take because there might be a lot of questions. Um, so things like block IO and stuff, I'm leaving till the end. OK, so why you should all care about this. <laughs> um, so, so control groups basically are for containing uh, processes on a system so that they don't um, take down the system as a whole or so that you can have some reliable level of service for applications on that system. So you know, if you've ever had you know, a bad plugin in Firefox, you know, a bad Flash app or something, take down your whole laptop. Or you know, if you're a sysadmin and you run uh, servers where you, know, you have various developers who are competing for resources, um, C groups is a way to sort of keep them in line and have a, a peaceful multi-tenant environment where you can guarantee that everyone has a certain portion of the CPU and the memory and so on. So yeah, uh, just a, a quick list. You, know, you, you can use C groups to try to contain malicious and buggy apps, um, lower the maximum latency that an app has. You know, when you're talking about the world of web apps, um, getting CPU uh, at the right time is very important. So making sure that things get sliced up you know, when you're running you know, 20 or 30 apps concurrently uh, is really important, uh, and C groups help do that. Uh, you're providing more predictable performance um, so that you know, when someone test, does a load test at one point and gets sort of a, a certain result in, in their benchmark, uh, they can rely on that because you've, you've sort of made a guarantee that you know, this is if you don't overcommit too much, of course. Um, uh, you can guarantee that they're going to get what they're allocated in their C group. Uh, and, and just in general, you're, you can allow a greater utilization of your resources. Um, you, you, you can do higher density uh, in your environment if you can guarantee that these apps can't step on each other um, as much. Um, so just to give you an idea of what all is out there, there are, there are a lot of controllers. We won't have time to talk about all these for sure. Um, there are controllers for, for memory, CPU, uh, network classes, uh, which basically allow you to use a, a traffic controller app to, to throttle bandwidth and things like that. Um, there's a devices control group. Um, I'll wait till these guys shut the door. Um, so the, the devices control group allows you to actually hide devices on the system from processes in that group. Um, uh, the freezer allows you to basically temporarily pause applications to potentially move them somewhere else. Uh, there's uh, block I.O. For, for disk I.O., obviously. Um, and, and huge TLB has to do with memory allocation. And, and then CPU sets has to do with um, basically CPU and memory pooling. I'm not real familiar with that one, and I don't think we'll have time for it. 
Um, but anyway, th this is a, how the list has grown over time. Uh, you know, it sort of started with CPU and memory, and, and then people figured out ways to implement uh, control groups for other resources on the system that, that people wanted to, to be able to slice up this way. Um, so uh, the most common things that people use C groups for are, are simply uh, limiting the amount of memory that processes can, can consume. Um, and then uh, setting uh, a CPU quota, basically saying that, that this C group can only use 30% of the CPUs on the system at all times, and after that it should you know, have to wait until the next cycle. Um, so we'll, we'll sort of talk about those first uh, and go through some demos. Um, so the, the tools that you can use to create C groups on the fly are um, CG create and CG set. Um, basically, all these are doing is um, writing to virtual files in, in the C group uh, file system structure. Um, the, the C group subsystems are mounted uh, sort of like proc. It's a virtual file system where you can cat things and echo things. And, and these are basically just helpers to, uh, to do that for you. You can do the same things with make dir and echo. Um, so actually, I'm going to do some quick demoing first here. So um, yeah, we can start with a simple command to see where things are mounted on your own system. If you've got a laptop and you're playing along here, um, you can use the mount command and see um, if you look for, oh, actually, it's not showing. Well, my first demo failure. Uh, so uh, let's see. Ah, there we go. So if we cat proc mounts on, on this particular system, we get something different than what mount shows us. Um, and, and you'll see in the list here uh, that we have C group mounts uh, for the various controllers. So we have CPU set, CPU, CPU account, and so on. Um, so we can go into one of these directories, and there are all these helpful files. Some of these are read-only, and some of them are writable. Um, although the permissions don't give us a good indication of that. So, um, so we can see statistics like you know, the usage in bytes overall for this particular control group and, and things like that. Um, so if we want to create a, a group here, we can use CG create. Um, I get these parameters right. So we can say in the memory controller, I want to create a group called foo. And then if we look here, we see that there's now a directory called foo. And it has magically all the same things in it. Um, just the same, we could do make dir bar. And if we cd into bar, all those files just show up. So basically, it works the same way, whether you use cg create or make dir. Um, so for setting a parameter, say limit in bytes, the default limit is something strange. <laughs> More memory than you could possibly have, right? Um, you can do cg set dash g memory. Uh, actually, let me make sure I get the syntax right. CG set. Uh, it's actually. Bytes. Something like that. Um, for. That strangely didn't do what I expected, but hmm.
That's not really what you want at all. That is. Oh, I know what it did. It rounded to a page. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's a, a point. I should have done my math right. So if I took something like you know, uh, seven sixty eight times ten twenty four or whatever, um, that should be a good round number. And then, right. So. It is actually setting things properly. It's just rounding to a page there. But you can see CG set and echo basically do the same thing. Um, the primary reason that people use the CG helper functions is that then you don't have to worry about looking up where your mount point is each time. You can just let the controllers live where they live and, and use the CG stuff to, to fetch and set. Um, so. Um, Next, let's talk a little bit about how you place applications. So um, CG exec is, is one way where when you launch a task, you can say CG exec and, and give it some command line options to tell it which controllers you want to turn on, and, and then you give the command line after that. Um, CG classify is a way to take a, um, an existing process and reclassify it into a C group. Um, PAM C group is something that you can use uh, when users log in or when processes are launched with run user or something else that goes through the PAM stack. Um, and then CG rules engine D um, is yet another option that basically takes a, a set of potentially complex rules in a config file uh, based on user and process name and group and things like that um, and basically monitors for uh, tasks to be exec and for um, user ID changes and, and GID changes of the app. And it gets, it gets notified by the kernel on all of those events and, and basically looks to see whether a task needs to be moved to a different C group based on that. Um, and you can use just plain old echo into the file system into a file called cgroup.prox, and that works to move a task as well. So we can look at some of those examples. Okay. So um, let's say I, uh, I have this uh, busy wait process that, that I use as an example. Um, so it's very simple. It's just a shell script that, uh, I guess I should move to the top of the screen to make sure that it gets on. So very simple shell script that basically just counts. It just does math. Um, so it can easily consume 100% of a CPU. Um, and so if I want to put that in a C group, I can just do uh, CG exec dash G CPU. Um, I think I have one called uh, share test. And then run that. And now if I look at the C group, um, I see that my process is, is there. I guess to show that it's the same process, there's busy.sh, 3662. Um, so um, that's one way to do it. Um, I can move that to another C group basically by saying echo 3662 to C group CPU uh, test, like that. And now if I go back and look at the original, there are no processes in the C group where the task was, and it's moved into the C group where I echoed it. OK, so um, about the configuration files. Uh, let's see. Wait a sec. Yeah. 
OK, so the, uh, the way that you can configure these so that you're not always setting things on the fly, because of course you're a sysadmin and you want to only do things once, um, is you have this cgconfig.conf. Um, oh, let's go through this with less. So cgconfig um, is where you set up both the mount points for your controllers uh, and, and also the groups that you want to be on the system at runtime. So uh, first you have this mount section um, right here where you define which controllers you're going to use. You don't have to mount them all. Um, it is possible to mount controllers, uh, multiple controllers under the same mount point. Um, for example, CPU and CPU account uh, on your system might be mounted together and there might be sim linking between them and things. Some distros do it that way. Um, there's not any real advantage to doing that except that you have fewer uh, mounts to look through when you're trying to figure out which tasks are where. Um, what you lose there is you can't put a task in uh, one controller uh, for memory and one for CPU if memory and CPU are mounted together because there's only one cgroup.prox file for that combined mount. Um, so usually we do things separately. And also you can't turn on and off controllers independently if they're mounted at the same place. So here, for example, uh, I've got a, a group for Apache, um, which I've used for some, uh, some testing. So with the memory limit in bytes, um, basically what happens when you run out of, of, of memory within your C group is your process gets killed. Um, so uh, it turns out to be a little bit of an interesting challenge to decide what to do. Um, when processes get killed like that, if you're a sysadmin, you know, how do you restart those or, you know, uh, what state is your app going to be in when one of those gets killed? Because if you've ever uh, witnessed a system um kill event, it's, it's bad. You usually, you don't know which processes are going to get killed. There's some tuning you can do, but once something gets killed, the whole system can be out of whack and you often just have to reboot to make sure that things are in good shape again. So, um, so really, you don't want things to be umkilled, but, but something has to happen when, when a C group runs out of memory, and, and umkill is the default. Um, so what it tries to do is uh, there, there is a reclaim process that happens first, where so the, the memory that gets charged to a control group is it, it's not just uh, you know, your malloc's. It's also, you know, your, your file caches and things like that, some of which can be dropped um, if you're running low on space. So it, there, there are processes in the kernel to try to do those things first to recover some memory. But as a last resort, you do get um, So uh, The other thing to mention about how I've set this particular C group up is there's the memory limit in bytes, and then there's the memory.memsw limit in bytes. And that second one is memory plus swap. Um, so, uh, and basically the reason that it's a memory plus swap limit instead of just a swap limit is really you don't care how much swap an app is, is using. And if it's an app that's sort of idle on your system, you don't care if all of it gets swapped out. So it's better to, to have a combined limit and let the kernel decide uh, when things are in swap or not. Um, so, you know, you have the memory limit because you may actually want to conserve resident memory and, and force things to swap out if, if they're uh, past a certain point. Um, although that presents challenges, you know, if an app gets into that range where it's using more than its uh, memory limit in bytes but less than its memory plus swap, it might end up uh, causing k swap d to work a lot to keep swapping things back in, even though you might have free memory on your system. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, when you're, you're sort of tuning your, your groups for memory and memory plus swap, that, that you don't, that, you know, it's expensive to make applications swap, uh, and if you've got free memory on your machine, you don't necessarily want that to happen. Uh, the other thing I have set here that, that's, that's interesting is the memory move charge at immigrate. 
So uh, as I mentioned, there are several different ways to place processes into C groups. Um, if you use something like PAM C group, where uh, a user's processes get C grouped immediately when they log in, um, it's no big deal because every process that they launch is already going to be in, in their C group. Um, but if you're using, if you're relying on things like CG Rules Engine D that uh, put processes in C groups after they've already started running and consumed some memory, you need to have this option turned on. Otherwise, the task, the the memory that was allocated by the process before it got moved will stay in the root C group or whatever C group it was launched as a part of, not where it actually belongs. Um, so, so this is something that, that we've seen in, in OpenShift where you know, we, we absolutely have to make sure that, that people get charged correctly for the, the memory that they're using. We can't have them you know, consume a half a gig of RAM and then get placed in their C group and, and have that charge not get moved. <clears throat> okay, so the, uh, the quota was the other one I was going to talk about. Uh, briefly that's fairly simple to understand. You know. um, basically, the, the quota is in microseconds. Uh, that's why the US. And um, it is as a fraction of the scheduler period, which is another setting in the C group. So uh, let's look in our CPU C group, the Apache one, for example. How many of you are familiar with the kernel scheduler at all? Okay, yeah, so I'm, I'm not gonna go in a lot of detail about how it works, but basically the, the scheduler um, has time slices and tries to you know, give somewhat equal portions of CPU uh, during each time slice to the processes that want to run. Um, and this sort of helps group processes so that when there's too much to run, the kernel can have a better view of uh, who should get how much time. So, oh, I've got this quota set to negative one right now. So negative one basically means that this C group can run as much as it wants during any given time slice. Um, it will never be throttled. Um, if I were to, uh, set it to something like uh, 30,000, which is what I had to find in the config file. And a typical period is uh, a tenth of a second, so 100,000 microseconds. Um, those values basically say that you can use 30% of one CPU on this machine. The machine might have 16 CPUs or something, um, but you're basically saying that it can use 30% of a CPU um, because it's 30,000 over 100,000 here. Um, so you know, if you had a, if you wanted to say that a, a C group could use you know, four CPUs, you would say 400,000 out of 100,000. Um, you can use smaller periods. You can use something down to I believe 5,000. Um, but when you slice things that small, it basically makes the scheduler work a whole lot harder, um, and it's not usually worth it because of the cost of context switching and things. So, so that's why we tend to use 100,000 here. Um, you can also go up to a full second, but then you'll have potentially apps that you know, run a little bit and have a visible stop <laughs> before the next second, and you don't necessarily want that sort of choppiness on your system. Uh, so, so you have to find a balance there. Um, so, yeah, let me go ahead and launch one of my busy wait processes in this C group and show you what happens. Do I still have one running? Let's kill that one first. Or actually, we can just put that one in the Apache C group. So if we echo 3662 into cgroup.prox, and you can see that in my last top command, it was using 100% of a CPU, pretty much, 98.6%. Um, now we can see that it's, it's being capped just under 30%, um, just like we told the C group to do. And of course, if we were to run 
uh, another uh, busy process. Uh, let's see. in the same C group, background it, then they'll have to share. So now each of them is going to be around 15%. And, and on average, they, they basically can't at any interval go over the 30% uh, the 30, uh, 30 limit. And then we get some interesting stats out of this. So if we look at um, CPU uh, uh, dot stat, what we get here, and is this OK on camera, by the way? Can, can you see the whole screen? I see the whole screen. OK, OK. Um, so um, what we see here is the number of periods that, uh, of CPU accounting when something wanted to run, the number of those periods when the C group was throttled. In other words, it exhausted its 30% allocation. Uh, and the kernel said, you're thrown off the processor. You, you can't run anymore. Um, and then we see the throttled time, which is basically the, the time that was remaining in that time slice uh, during which the process still wanted to run but was not allowed. Um, so you can tell uh, as an administrator when things are, you know, are asking for a lot more time than you're giving them when this throttled time goes way up. Um, and one thing that people find confusing uh, about C groups is that some numbers are measured in microseconds, some are measured in nanoseconds. And if you conflate those, then you'll uh, end up with some really strange stats. Um, this particular number, I believe, is in nanoseconds. Um, in uh, CPU accounting, which we'll also look at here, because these go hand in hand, there are also numbers that are in nanoseconds. So uh, oh, it is not. Oh, because I didn't CG exec it correctly. So interesting point here. So if I now echo 3662 to C group prox here, Right now, I'm immediately seeing my CPU accounting as well. But when I did the CG exec, I only put it in the CPU group. And so I wasn't getting accounting data. Right, so that's a number in nanoseconds. And, and these are in, uh, now, the, that one, I believe, is in milliseconds, which is strange. Yeah, or no, this one might be Hertz. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, so this one's in hundredths of a second. So uh, the, those differences in, in how things are measured can be a little bit confusing. Okay, so right. So we've talked a little bit about the metrics um, that, that you can see: uh, CPU stat, CPU account usage. Um, you can see for the memory controller, um, you can see the current usage in bytes, and you can see the maximum usage in bytes. So you can see whether uh, a group has ever hit its memory limit by seeing whether the max usage for the group is equal to the limit, which is, which is useful sometimes. You can also see the, uh, a fail count for both memory and memory plus swap. Uh, and basically, the fail count doesn't necessarily mean that uh, an application uh, in the group got um killed. It simply means that memory was exhausted and one of those reclaim events had to happen or uh, potentially uh, a malloc returned non-zero and said, no, I just can't allocate this. There are other situations where uh, memory that's already mapped but not written to, when you write to it, um, you basically go beyond the limit. And that's the sort of situation where you get um killed. Um, usually, a, just a malloc won't, won't cause a kill. It will cause this fail count to go up. Um, 
So, and memory.stat is, uh, it gives you a breakdown of, we'll go look at it, uh, the different ways in which memory is consumed. So, so this is in the root group. Um, you know, if, if you're not a sort of low-level kernel guy, then a lot of this won't mean much to you, but at least a few of them will. Uh, things like RSS, you know, your resident memory versus swap uh, and uh, you know, versus cache space. Uh, and page in, page out is an interesting one. What that's telling you is um, how many pages have been charged and uncharged from this group. So it tells you how much you know, you've got processes coming in and out and allocating and deallocating memory. Um, so uh, that can be useful when you see things like uh, your system is, uh, is swapping a lot. Uh, if you find a certain C group that's beyond its memory limit and into its memory plus swap limit, and it's doing a lot of this page in, page out, um, that all those charges and uncharges could result in things having to be swapped in and swapped out. Um, so, so that's, uh, that's a good metric there. Um, all right. Uh, so the next thing that's probably worth talking about is, is the memory.um control file. And, uh, basically what that tells you is, is two things. It, it tells you whether umkill is enabled, uh, and whether the C group is currently under um. So, uh, very simple structure. Here, um kill disable is zero, which means that um kill is enabled. Just strange. Uh, and then under um zero means that it's not currently under um. So, the reason that umkill disable came about is that someone realized that there are there are situations where being umkilled is is not the the most graceful thing that you can do. In particular, with something like Apache, um, if you've got it running where it's you know spawning worker threads and one of those workers gets killed, it'll just spawn a new one and hit its limit again. So uh, it's often better behavior to say when this C group runs out of memory, just stop it, don't let it process anymore, and I will do something as an administrator to handle that. Um, what you have to do in that situation, though, is be uh, notified. Um, so is anyone familiar with uh, iNotify and EventFD and, and that sort of framework to, to get notifications from the kernel? Um, so basically, you can write code to be immediately notified when one of these events happens, when, when this under um goes from zero to one, um, and then you can have a process that deals with that and you know, shuts down the application, brings it back up, cleans things up however you need to, and so on. So, so with um kill disable, that is sort of easier to do than if you let the kernel kill things and then you try to clean up. Um, uh, one of the tricks that I've also used is when you get that, that message, you can go raise the limit. Uh, you know, you can have your, your script respond by saying, oh, okay, that app needs a little bit more memory and I'm okay with that, so I'll give it a little bit more. But then I'll probably restart it to get it to free whatever it's leaked anyway. But, um, yeah, that, that I've found helpful. Um, Okay, so now let's talk about the hierarchy of C groups a little bit. Um, you know, the, the C groups are always in a hierarchy. It's a tree, uh, and every task has to be somewhere in it. By default, things are going to be in the root of the tree, um, unless you place them elsewhere based on rules or uh, a CG exec call or whatever. Um, Hierarchical limits are optional for memory, which means that you can have a parent C group have one limit and a child have a different limit and you can make them completely unrelated. There's a use hierarchy uh, attribute that you can set to one if you would like them to be related, which means that um, you, know, you can have a, a parent with an eight gig uh, memory limit and you know, 10 children with you know, 
four gig limits, which means that there are two different ways that, that you can have an OOM event. You can either have it in one of the children exhausting its limit, or you can have all the children as, as an aggregate exhausting the parent limit. Um, so, so you may find that to be valuable. Um, CPU settings, on the other hand, always impact the children. So when you start doing uh, CPU shares, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, the, the shares of the parent always determine the maximum usage that the children as a whole can have. Um, and then for, for block IO, um, the hierarchy is experimental. So that means, in my mind, mostly it doesn't work yet. <laughs> you should, there, there is a sane behavior option uh, that you can turn on to, to, to enforce the hierarchy, but, uh, but they call it purely experimental at this point. Um, so, I've already talked about a couple of these. Um, swappiness is the other memory tunable uh, that, that's uh, worth mentioning. So, swappiness, uh, have, has anyone ever tuned that at the system-wide level to, yeah, okay, good. So, this is the same idea as the system-wide swappiness, but if you have a group, for example, that you would like to stay resident all the time, you can set swappiness to zero for just that group. Uh, so if you've got a, a one particular process that needs to be very low latency and you just can't afford to have it paging things in and out, set swappiness to zero and you're good. It will stay in memory all the time. Um, Right, so CPU shares are, are very interesting. It, it's, it works kind of like the stock market, <laughs> kind of like getting a share of stock, that it's, it's worth something uh, relative to the, to the whole. You have to know how many shares exist to really know what it is as a percentage uh, of anything. Um, so um, basically, we'll go through an example because this can get complicated. Um, so 1024 is the default that things are given. If you don't, if you don't go modifying things, every CPU uh, C group that you create is going to have 1024. And um, as I said on the previous slide, the parent will always have implicitly 1024 in relation to its children. And so I made this little uh, example where uh, the top level C group has 1024. There are two children each at 512, which basically, if you look at just those three, um, it's gonna be 50% for the 1024 one, 25% for the 512, and 25%, you know, the way the ratios work, that, that you know, because the total there is 2048, and, and so, um, you know, 512 over 2048 is 25%, basically. Um, where it gets a little bit strange is when you go down here and you're looking at a process in this middle C group here versus the children here. Um, this is where the implicit 1024 comes into play. So relative to these two, this one has a 1024 share. So I did a little map of the calculations um, on the next slide here. So. I might have to toggle back and forth in between these. Yeah, so, so basically, at, at the top level, you have 2048, and then I did the math for the 50 and 25. But in this little subtree, you have a 1024, a 512, and a 1024, even though that's not what it looks like here. So, um, so basically, a process in this C group will get 10% relative to, to uh, the whole. Um, and I've got an example that, that shows that that actually works. Um, let me go back in my history here. Uh, so I've got my busy test app.
So um, I just have a little wrapper for my, for my script that's basically launching these, doing CG exec to launch these into the different C groups. The, the C groups that I have set up here in CPU have uh, share test as the top level, and it's got the 1024 shares. And then I've got A with 512 and B with 512. Right, so, so those are set as they were on the slide. And if we run top now, You can basically see, oh, I might have an old one running, don't I? That now these should. Oh, I have another old one. Right, so there are my, are my five. And they're breaking down as the slide showed. Um, 50, 25, 10, 10, and 5 is about how they're breaking down. You'll see a little bit of wavering, but, but that's how it turns out. So, so calculating those shares can be a little bit strange, and I would suggest not really overdoing it. Although, in general, um, using shares to uh, sort of enforce what portion of the system uh, uh, a C group gets is a little bit better than the than throttling things because what happens when you throttle is that you can end up with a lot of unused CPU cycles. Um, you know, if you've got an app that's throttled at 30% of a CPU and nothing else is running on the system, then you're just wasting 70% of your CPU. Whereas uh, when you're just weighting things with these shares, you know, it, it, as long as nothing else wants to run, a C group can take the entire CPU or all of the multiple CPUs on the system, and that's generally good for utilization. Okay, so um, we talked a little bit about cgconfig.conf already. Um, the thing that parses that is called cgconfig parser. Um, one thing that's uh, interesting about that is you can, um, you can actually make multiple cgconfig files and, and load them. There's, there's one service on your distro that, that loads Etsy CG config, but you can run CG config parser by hand to load another file with more C groups in it. Um, the one thing that CG config parser complains about, though, is if you uh, specify mounts that are already mounted, then, then that doesn't work well. Um, so, so if you ever try to load a, a CG config file on the fly, uh, after your system is started up and the subsystems are mounted and tasks are running and things, you, you have to omit the mount section uh, from your config. Um, and yeah, let's talk about cgrules.conf here a little bit. So I have a, a bunch of rules for performance testing that, that I was doing where, where basically you know, every user just gets uh, put into uh, a C group for all of these controllers. And these lines are very simple. It's the, the first field is the user. The second field is the set of controllers that you want to enable. And the third line is uh, which C group you want to put them in. Uh, Another uh, technique that you can use in this file is uh, basically you can say if you know, there's a process owned by root and it's called cron-d, then put it in the CPU and CPU accounting groups in the cron-c group. Um, throttling cron jobs is kind of a strange thing to do because they need to run on a schedule, but if you have uh, jobs that tend to get out of control, um, it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, I, I've, I've 
yeah, kind of gone back and forth uh, on, on whether that's a good thing for my systems or not because we, we had an experience where cron jobs were taking way more uh, processing time than, than I expected because every time a sysadmin noticed something that they, they felt they wanted to measure on the system, uh, they would just add another script and another script and, and yeah, soon you're just spending all your time on crons, and so we, we sort of throttled it back. But then we looked at, the, at how much things were actually getting throttled and started to pare down our scripts so that it was no longer needed. Uh, you know, when, and, and when the, basically the throttle time nears zero, you realize, oh, okay, we don't need to have these throttled anymore because they're actually not using that much. Um, so, yeah, th there, are, there are other things that you can do with CG rules. Like I said, you can use groups and other things too, um, but I usually keep this fairly simple. Um, CG rules can actually, the, the CG rules engine daemon can use a lot of CPU as well. If you have lots of C groups defined and you're launching lots of processes, every time you spawn a new process, it has to handle that notification and look through its whole rule set to decide where that process should be. Um, so that can take a lot of effort. Uh, okay, so now let's talk about system D because really what they decided uh, after several years of developing C group uh, technology in the kernel and, and the user space tools to deal with them, um, I think everyone was having the same problems. Uh, if you're dynamically managing C groups, um, you end up with locking issues. If you have several different processes that are creating C groups, deleting C groups, chain, you know, tuning the settings and things like that, um, then, then you, you end up with lock timeouts and things. Uh, cause th there's, there's actually a, a global lock in the kernel for, for C group changes because of some of the things that need to happen when you change the, the allocations. Um, so what they decided is that there should be a single process in user space that owns C group control, and now system D is that process for uh, most Linux distros. And so this means that, that all the old tools like CG exec and, and uh, CG classify and so on were, were deprecated. Uh, I presented them because if you're adminning RHEL 6 or Ubuntu LTS or lots of other distros, they are still quite relevant and there's no other way to do things. Uh, but in the system D world, everything changes and they say don't use those things. Um, so the way that, that, that the system D world works is um, there's a more defined hierarchy of groups. Uh, they call all of the intermediate groups that aren't leafs at the bottom of the tree um, slices. And there's a system slice, a machine slice, and a user slice by default. Uh, system is for any of your daemons that start up. Uh, machines is for your Docker containers and your QEMU uh, VMs and things like that. Uh, and then users are for user sessions. Um, and Below that, you have scopes and services, and, and basically, uh, you have a, a service C group for every service that starts on your system. Uh, and you have scopes, which are very similar for basically uh, sessions, so things like a user login. Um, so, one thing that's nice is the systemd tools are pretty polished um, in terms of being able to look at your C groups and see what they're doing. So, um, for example, I can do a uh, yeah, systemd cgls. This will show me in a nice pager view all of the slices and scopes that are on my running system right now. So you can see that in the user slice, I have an SSD, SSH session. Uh, it's called session one here. And, and here are all the processes inside that session. Uh, and then system, you can see all the services, policy kit, audit D, and so on, running in their own service groups. And then if we run uh, their CG top command, you actually get some st statistics here. Now, um, in this case, uh, 
I actually don't have uh, accounting for most of the data here. So let me run something that will produce some. So here I can do, uh, see. I'm going to fall back on old commands real quick. So, let's see. We're actually, I need to check my mounts here. All right, so CPU count is mounted. Okay, this part of the demo might not work. Uh, okay, so there's some better stats on my laptop. I'm not sure why I wasn't getting stats in my VM, but, but this is the kind of view that you get with, with CG Top uh, from System D. Uh, you can see that the, the higher level uh, parts of the hierarchy are showing aggregate stats, and so they're always going to be at the top of the list. You know, root is always going to be using th all of the CPU, you know, the, the, aggre the aggregate of the children, essentially. So, um, but you can see in this case that, that my RHEL 6.5 uh, machine uh, is using a whole lot of CPU because I've got all those busy processes uh, still running over there from the earlier demo. Um, and you can see how much, how much memory each of those machines is using and things like that. Uh, so that's pretty useful. Um, the, uh, the way that you set um, your uh, C group attributes now is with systemctl set property. Uh, and what that actually does for things like uh, services is it writes a file to Etsy that defines uh, the attributes so that, um, and it also, it, it writes them to the, the C group subsystem at runtime as well, um, but, but it saves them for the next boot so that they're persistent. Um, so the, uh, I should have some files in here from, from previous settings. Let's see. set up. So what I want here is something like I believe that syntax is right. No, it's not. Okay, this is where I fall back on the internet. <coughs> Can't have everything in memory and it didn't make my slides. Oh, I'm running very short on time and I've missed, <laughs> I've missed all your cues. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna stop here and <laughs> let people ask questions. I apologize for running longer than I had intended to. Um, yeah, I know I've kind of stumbled through some points of this. So, <laughs> questions, please. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that is a useful piece of data. Yeah, I mean, it varies based on distro, but yes, it, it is in the, the libc group tools, yeah. Uh, all of, the, all of the, the legacy tools are part of the libc group project, yeah. So, including the PAM module and everything else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is very useful for us. So, uh, 
type of infrastructure, what about desktop? Do you see this being rolled out with default? So, so it, it is. So part of the, the move to system D is that everyone is implicitly using C groups now. Um, if you're using system D, then, then at least at the level of things like CPU shares, uh, there, there has to be something there. You, you, can't, you can't have the CPU uh, subsystem mounted and not have some sort of shares defined. So. Um, yeah, whether you actively do anything or not, you're, you're using C groups there. Um, and, and it's useful because, you know, you don't necessarily want your daemons to get all of the time on your, on your laptop, and you don't want your browser to get all of the time either. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know how much, you know, the average user will actually try to contain individual apps, but as we move toward more people using containers for things like their web browser, you absolutely will be able to do that fairly easily. Is there another question over here? So uh, it is one of the things used, uh, uh, sorry, um, yeah, so the question in the back was, that, is this uh, what underlies uh, LXC? Um, so containers are actually a lot of different things. C groups are, are one part. There are also kernel namespaces, which is another thing. Uh, so so there, there are, are various uh, aspects as to what actually makes a container. No. This is really just about resource management. Okay, so the question is, if you're trying to control scheduling with NICE and also with C groups, how do those play together? Um, so I don't know in all cases how that would work, but the, the C groups would be more authoritative, especially for things like the quota. You know, what the, once you exhaust your quota, you're done no matter what your NICE value is, right? Um, so there may be some minor shuffling that can happen, and NICE would still matter for processes that are in the same C group, um, and you know, that realistically you're not going to have uh, you know, hundreds of C groups on your system. You're, you're, you're going to try to uh, aggregate certain things into the same C group, and even things like you know, Firefox has multiple processes and, and things like that. So it's not, you know, we don't live in a one process per C group sort of world. So, so NICE would still have some value within a group. Other questions? Okay. I, I hope this was useful. <laughs> Apologize for my somewhat lack of preparedness, but uh, I hope everybody learned something. <laughs>
Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.